Welcome to day three, week three of the month long Ideas Festival hosted by Bitsom. And if you're new and if you're coming in for the first time, welcome. We promise that this is going to be an exciting, excellent time for new ideas to get fostered. And when you have conversations with them about them later on, you'll have even more ideas. For those of you who are joining back after two weeks of listening to some great ideas, welcome back. Time flies, isn't it? I mean, it is like yesterday that we had those great conversations with, uh, with uh, the last week, if you recall, we had these great conversations with Sridhar, uh, Sridhar Vembu, Deep Kalra. And of course, who would forget the wonderful story that Vishy Anand shared about how he was on a train when somebody came in and said that you can't quit studies unless, of course, you're Vishy Anand. So these kinds of stories have kept me going. And I shared some of them with my mom, the old lady that she is. She was extremely thrilled. And I wanted to start by reminding us that it is in conversation with other people about the things that we pick up from here that our ideas get embellished even further and we are able to internalize what comes up from here. Having said that, I must reassure you that sit back, relax, enjoy what comes up from here. But even as you soak in, remember to do a few things very clearly. Please ensure that you keep looking at two places, at what comes from the stage, number one, and also, what's going on in the chat window because the chat window gives you a window to the world of conversations that are happening about the sessions that are on from the stage today as well like the last two weeks we have a cracker of sessions lined up wonderful people great ideas and brilliant conversations are going to keep us company now as we start, I must. I, be, I made a note to myself that I have to remind you, if you're on AirMeet and if you're trying to work your systems through and if your audio is not working or sometimes you'll find the speaker's audio not working, we're just living still in the pandemic times. And as we wade through that, some tech glitches are all but normal from your side or from the other side. And when these happen, please remember to just stay calm work your way through and things will work out well. Keep the chat going. And as we speak, we also have from our side, two interesting, important elements from that will come up after each session. At the end of session one, you will have the visual graphic recorder, Santosh Naya, that will come up. His graphic work will come up that captures all the conversations that have happened. At the end of session two, so will it for us to just understand and remember all that has happened in the session in the form of one graphic. The Founding Fuel team, of which I am the director, and le uh, director for Learning and Change, will also do its best to capture the nuggets from the session and send it back to you so that you're able to process these and the sessions stay back with you for far longer than they happen on stage. The other interesting element that is going to happen is also the students from Bitsom are going to be part of this conversation at the end of each session, just for us to hear an intergenerational lens of all that they have heard and all that we have heard from the stage. That's that for now from my side. And I have to hand you over to the first conversation that's coming up. To lead that conversation is Professor Lena Chatterjee. She has over 37 years of experience just teaching in the IIM Calcutta. And uh, now she is a professor of OB in uh, Bitsom. And under her, in her class, have sat many CEOs and several people who have gone on to build various organizations around the world. That's all I will say about her, for she is going to introduce you to various other people who have broken glass ceilings of many Jesus. kinds. Over to you, Professor Chatterjee.
Thank you so much, Kavi. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, host this evening's first conversation. And if you recall, the conversation is on what I learned during the pandemic. And therefore, in this discussion today, we are going to be trying to reflect on and distill the learnings from the past two years where you know all of us had to face a lot of chaos uncertainty and stress and to do that with us we have two very renowned leaders from the industry who have been at the helm of large global organizations in pharma uh, healthcare and technology and banking and they are going to share with us their insights of how they managed during the last two years, what they learned, and also about how they motivated and supported their teams. And finally, about how they are building and fostering resilience in their employees and their organizations as they go forward. So I really look forward to an engaging conversation with them. Let me please extend a very warm welcome to Mr. G. V. Prasad, who is the chairman and managing director of Dr. Reddy's Laboratories, and Mrs. Arundhati Bhattacharya, chairperson and CEO of Salesforce India. Uh, I'm really, really excited to have both of you here, and I do look forward to an engaging and enlightening conversation. Um, I thought that I would start with you, Prasad. Uh, I thought that, you know, I could ask you about, you know, you have had over four decades of experience in leading and also transforming organizations. Now, what were some of the personal leadership challenges that the last two years posed for you that were new and different from anything that you've dealt with in the past? First of all, I, I'd like to thank you for having me on this show. I'm really honored to share this virtual space with uh, eminent leader like Arundhati. Um, I, I have to speak from my own experience, and I have to say that uh, the last two years for all of us has been something that we would never have imagined a few years ago. Uh, I think we started the pandemic with a lot of fear, with a lot of anxiety, and uh, uh, you know, worrying about how the organization could stay afloat and do what it is supposed to do. And it was uh, the first few days were really surreal for me. Uh, when everything was under lockdown, I, being a pharmaceutical company, we were allowed to operate. And uh, our labs and our testing facilities and our manufacturing facilities needed people on the site. Uh, Usually it takes me an hour and a half to go to the factory that I was going. And uh, during the lockdown, it took me about 25, 30 minutes because there was no nobody on the street and it was just surreal experiencing that. It was uh, it was like I was in a different uh, you know planet. Um, initially, of course, we all had a lot of panic, everybody in the organization. But uh, I must say that uh, uh, the management team, the leaders at every level responded magnificently uh, with, you know, great clarity. Uh, the, our CEO, Erez, who actually runs the company, um, outlined two priorities for the organization. One was the safety and well-being of our employees. And so we did everything we could to make the workplace as safe as possible, put all the safeguards, put all the protocols, uh, put preventive measures, all of that. And the second one was that people around the world depend on us for their medications. So we had to keep the supplies going, which means in spite of all the disruption, we had to keep the factories running. We had to keep the labs working. And um, this clarity, I think, was shared by all the management team. And uh, everybody understood what they had to do. The learnings from this experience uh, of uh, running the organization when through this pandemic, uh, they, I can bucket them under two or three th areas. One was, I think, um, it it brought great strategic clarity of what is 
the most important thing that for the company to do and all the extra things that we did we could you know just drop them midway and we realized that we do a lot of unnecessary stuff in organizations uh which you know suddenly we feel you know why are we doing these things so that kind of clarity emerged second thing was that when people are driven by a purpose and they have clarity they will not worry about the difficulties they have and they will go the extra mile uh being always an organization from its founding by the by dr anjay reddy himself very purpose driven organization so it was a kind of a you know calling for all of us to become part of the solution and that brought unleashed a lot of energy in terms of uh, uh, bringing products to the market keeping the operations running keeps the lab labs running and all of that the other thing we saw is that you know what normally takes a lot of time can be greatly accelerated if all the stakeholders work together and in this case it is the global companies ourselves the government the regulator all of us had the same goals and uh, this really accelerated work and uh, the collaboration with the government during this last two years has been fantastic uh and i really hope that uh, that relationship continues the way it was these were some lessons of course everything accelerated in in our industry because of the urgency especially for bringing med- medicines for covid vaccines for covid what normally takes years to do we achieved in months and i'm really proud of the way the global industry the pharmaceutical industry has responded to bring solutions to people Uh, so these are some lessons and i can share more as we go on thank you thank you so wonderful you know a greater sense of purpose uh, you know collaboration and you know having clearer goals and priorities so that it's sharper and more focused as you move forward these are some of the things that uh, you said are the important takeaways um thank you uh, we'll come back to some of these in greater detail as we go along but meanwhile arundhati i think you know you were in a very unique position because you know how courageous you joined a new organization after 40 years in sbi right in the beginning of the pandemic so you know you had a kind of a double whammy you had to deal with all the uncertainty of joining a new organization you know moving from a very large i don't know may i say a little bureaucratic organization like sbi and then into a, a a young sort of organization like salesforce india a technology firm where your employees were much younger uh, you know and you had to also reassure them and uh, you know uh, you you had to engage with both the workforce as well as the priorities of your organization right you know maybe even before you started so what were your learnings and challenges and how do you uh, manage to kind of unlearn or relearn what you learned earlier in your new role i think you are muted yeah sorry uh, first of all thank you for having me on this uh, fantastic forum and uh, actually mr prasad uh, stole my first line when he said that he came onto the platform because i was there because frankly i'll tell you and it is uh, the actual truth i'm on this platform because he's here and i really and truly wanted to listen to him especially the pharmaceutical industry has been such a huge support for us uh, you know and i've seen the way they have worked and i really and truly wanted to hear a uh, first hand from him and what better uh, way of to do it Uh, accepting for being on the same platform uh, having said that let me first tell you maybe i was a little bit foolish but uh, when i joined i never really imagined that everything would remain virtual for so long i uh, you know i thought it would be a matter of two or three months and then we'd get back to normalcy uh, i'd be back in the office and you know yes of course i'd have to learn a number of new things but the main thing that i have learned throughout this pandemic is how resilient human beings are how resilient we are in changing and adapting uh, as you rightly said you know i 
did about four years as chairman of SBI. And thereafter, you know, for two, two and a half years, I was on various boards and I was a consultant to various companies, but more or less in the top strata. Now, in those positions, you don't really have to deal with the uh, computer hardware. Uh, somebody or the other sets it all up for you. My first course was, you know, setting up the entire hardware system uh, by myself. Uh, first, I had to do it with the hardware that was already available with me, uh, because even uh, those, uh, the sending of the hardware was forbidden for, say, about two months or three months. And then the company hardware arrived. And oh my, trying and setting that all up was not a joke. Uh, the first and foremost, of course, I set up the mobile and I set up the laptop and felt very good about it. But, you know, as the days went on, I decided that these guys should have taken an eye test before actually giving me uh, an appointment. Because looking at all those little, little numbers, you know, that were crowding your dashboards, it was a real misery for me. End of the day, you know, I was putting eye drops all the time trying to manage till the colleague told me, why don't you get a bigger monitor? Just ask them for it. So of course I asked them for a bigger monitor. And as soon as I asked it, right. Now I had to set it up all over again to mirror the laptop. Okay. And because probably they found me to be a good student that I could do all of these. Now they have supplied me with a monitor, which is really high end. I'm told that there are only three people in India who are having this monitor in our company. But as a result of that, I'm not able to take out the background, which you all had requested me to do. Because this is a new monitor. Okay, So I'm still learning. Uh, you've got to bear with me for that period of time. But you know, these are all the sort of things, the all the sort of experiences that happen on a very personal level. But on a more, uh, you know, official level, Yes, it was very, very difficult managing the whole show without really meeting any of your colleagues. I had not been to a single location in India. I had not met a single colleague. Everything was on the virtual platform. So getting to know people is very tough. And actually speaking, you know, the first offsite we had in Goa, which was sometime after the abatement of the second wave, uh, you know, one of, the, one of our colleagues told me, Ma'am, you know, don't you think that when we are having these virtual conversations, somewhere or the other, the height of the person should appear? So, you know, that made me realize that, well, I'm really short. I'm, it's really meaning I'm about five, five feet, two and a half inches. So, you know, obviously, they were probably expecting somebody who would be taller and more imposing. And similarly, I found it very strange that for some people, I was really looking up while talking to them. While on the screen, it had all been, you know, eyeball to eyeball contact. So, yes, you know, there are difficulties when you are doing everything on a virtual platform. <clears throat> and not only that, I think the third thing that came up was the fact that, you know, the, we suddenly found that the opportunities were absolutely exploding because everybody realized that, you know, we had to have an omnichannel presence, that we had to have a work from anywhere culture. We had to have an ability to connect with our customers, with our other stakeholders from all channels. Now, with that being the case, the opportunity for a company like ours was enormous because you know one thing that we have, and I think this we have better than anybody else today in the world, is that we have the entire customer data in one place. The integration that we have that we are able to provide that is not something that is easily done by others. They have point solutions, but you know, putting it all together was something that we did very well. And therefore, you know, there was a huge amount of, uh, you know, uh, of um, uh, solutions that we could actually offer to the industry as such. And uh, not only was this available for India, it was available for the world. And again, if you are delivering for the world, Ultimately, you have to come back to talent in India. Now, as a result of that, during this period, actually, when I joined, we were 2,500 people. Today, we are 6,500 people almost. So, you know, we traveled during this period of time, all of them virtual, all of them youngsters, all of them really wanting to meet. And how do you keep them engaged? 
So I think, you know, what we, we really taught ourselves different ways of doing things. We taught ourselves to find, you know, solutions. We taught ourselves workarounds. And we taught ourselves as we went along as to how we talk to customers, even on a virtual plane and still get them that same feeling, that same excitement that we'd be able to convey to them had we been physically in the same room. So, you know, those are the sort of things that we learned during this period. But I think, you know, more than anything else, it showed us what is the, the ability of a human being to sort of be resilient, to be able to adapt, to change, to learn new things. All of this was brought home to us in a, you know, really, really personal fashion. That's lovely. You know, I think you've talked a lot about, uh, you know, just from your stories, mm -hmm. one can see that the whole attitude of being positive and, you know, taking on every challenge in a, you know, uh, kind of a hopeful and positive way. Uh, also to, uh, you know, uh, try and create energy and excitement among your employees in terms of looking for solutions to uh, deal with the situation and with their clients and to keep innovating and trying to sort of improve the interactions as they go along. So a very interesting uh, learning from that whole experience. But I just want to kind of delve a little deeper. You know, uh, when you joined, I think, in April 2020, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Yes. And then you suddenly, you know, you ramp up your... Uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, your number of employees. A lot of people are joining in. Uh, you have to create a culture, uh, you know, and get them socialized into the system on the go through maybe virtual means. And in spite of all of that, your organization sort of jumped. I think you know, 29 places in the one of the best places to work. Uh, you know, uh, surveys in 2021. So you have done something right in terms of, you know, getting that engagement. So how would you distill that? How can you, could you share your, uh, you know, your, what you did and how you did it? Because that would be a tremendous learning for all of us. So I think, you know, uh, Lena, what, did, what was done basically, you know, before I came on board, uh, the India operations was not unified in the sense we had a sales and distribution organization we had a uh, uh, technology marketing and product organization. We had an organization that was doing support. We had an organization that was running Salesforce on Salesforce because Salesforce is always customer zero on whatever we do. So we try it out first on ourselves and then only we send it out you know, for our customers to use. So we had these huge uh, you know, support pieces who were supporting global operations but nobody was really talking to each other. We were all in different bits and pieces. That is the reason why they created the CEO position. The position that I came in actually was not there till I came in. And that was also one of the reasons, you know, why I did join. Because I had always questioned myself that, you know, whatever I could do in SBI, was it because I got a ready-made platform? I got a platform that had been created over 200 long years. So, you know, it was all very well set. It was all very well, uh, you know, ordered. Uh, I knew exactly what I could do and what I couldn't do, you know, whether it be delegation of powers, whether, you know, the reporting structures, what were my areas that I could sort of exercise it in. All of that was known. And here I was coming into an organization which in the org chart itself didn't have an India head. There was no India CEO. And believe me, the time you were talking bureaucracy, you know nothing about the bureaucracy of the private sector. And I <laughs> you to tell my people I'm longing to get out of this place because I'm going to write a book, you know, again, on what is, you know, the, the, the myths regarding the public sector and the myths regarding the private sector. There are lots and lots of them, believe me. And bureaucracy being less in the private sector is not always true. Okay, they are nimble in certain ways, but in certain other ways, well, they can be very bureaucratic. The org chart that I put together had to go through five revisions before more or less I got consensus that this will do. Because somebody or the other always had a problem. 
See, at the end of the day, I was trying to create a position, meaning I was actually going to carve out certain jobs which people were already doing. Not everything was being done by everybody. Otherwise, we'd have had a unified operation. But definitely, there was overlap. And if there is overlap, as you know, people can be very territorial, yes. extremely territorial. So for them to agree that they can cede this piece to me without reducing the importance they have in the organization, and for me to explain this to them and get them to agree to it. I didn't want to do anything without proper agreement. I wanted people to really join in and to sort of buy into the idea of what I was trying to do. Because what I was trying and telling them is that, look, we have so many people. We need many more people in India if we are going to deliver the goals of this company. And all of them cannot be supported properly unless and until there is one unified leadership. And if you ask me what is the reason that you know we have jumped so many steps, I think it's because employees started feeling supported. Employees really and truly started feeling supported because they had somebody, somebody to whom they could go to within the country. And they didn't have to go to San Francisco or to Sydney or to Singapore in order to get their stuff done. They had somebody here. And this was all the more true, you know, during the second wave of the crisis. The way we could stand up the helpline for all, all for uh, not only our employees here, but also employees whose parents were here, but who themselves were outside. And not only that, the way the entire global organization jumped into help. In a matter of three days, we could actually get 2,200 global volunteers to run the helpline so that we could also sleep. But besides that, Mark, who's the founder of this organization, and he was a sole CEO at that point of time, he personally calls to find out what is it that we wanted. And they had been supplying PPEs to many developing countries and all. And they asked me about it. I said, no, not PPEs, because we are exporting PPEs. We have enough of it. So he asked me, what is it that you want? I said, what we want is oxygen. So he said, fine, that's what we'll get you. So, you know, in a space of three, uh, the, the three flights uh, that landed in the month of May, we got 6,600 concentrators. We imported them, plus 10,000 pulse oximeters. And we distributed them through the NGOs to many, many of these organizations that needed them. So that's the kind of, you know, uh, what should I say? Mobilizing of the entire organization that could be done. And that is the reason why people started feeling supported. And that's the reason why, you know, the, the, the ranking in the great places for to work that went up. So I think these were learnings that we all got. But, uh, well, uh, you know, the, it did mean a lot of fights externally, but I think even more internally, <laughs> if I should be. Well, well, well I know you're used to that because you've <laughs> always tried to make a difference wherever you went. So, you know, I'm sure that you know, you have a never say die attitude. Mm -hmm. So um, it's very interesting. I thought I would now move to shift the conversation to the business opportunities that the pandemic threw up across your dom domains in, uh, you know, pharma and in technology, because these were two industries which actually, you know, were really a part of this whole solution for the COVID, uh, you know, uh, process of uh, pandemic. So while dealing with the crisis, how did you focus your leadership team's energies on citing new opportunities and going after them? And, uh, you know, how did you realign your stakeholders in order to achieve the goals that you wanted to? And, you know, Prasad, you were talking about cutting down all the, uh, you know, non-important areas and focusing on your priorities. As a leader, did you have to significantly reshape and alter your leadership team's priorities as well? You know, to be very honest, uh, the, uh, the the pursuit of the opportunity this was, became very organic for us. Okay. Uh, being in the pharmaceutical business, we saw this as an opportunity to serve, to bring solution to the people. And on day one, actually, when the lockdown was announced, one of the R&D guys said, you know, there's going to be a shortage of sanitizers. And I know how to make a sanitizer and he quickly repurposed some equipment 
made some tons of sanitizer without seeking any approval from anybody. And then, of course, there were a lot of sanitizers. We couldn't sell it. We gave it away to all the people. Then one of the leaders who is responsible for global uh, alliances stepped up and called every company which was in antivirals. And in the short span of two years, uh, we launched many, many products. Some of them succeeded, some of them failed, but all of them, the purpose was to find a solution to the pandemic. We collaborated first with Fuji of Japan to bring uh, Favipravir to India. We were the global partners for them. We supplied it all over the world, did the clinical trials in India. We then worked with Gilead, became a licensee for Remdesivir, which was a mainstay and which is still a mainstay for uh, COVID. And uh, we manufactured it in record time, did the trials and brought it to market. We currently partner with Merck. We have a partner with a Russian company, RDIF, to bring Sputnik vaccine to India. We partnered with the Defense uh, Research Development Organization. And uh, it was quite an experience experience working with the defense establishment to bring one of their products, which they were experimenting for radiation uh, therapy, uh, to repurpose it for COVID. And uh, it was uh, a phenomenal night and day kind of work we did and brought this product to the market. Many of them did not work because we had to accelerate everything, so we couldn't completely test all products. But we did play a major role. And of course, it also helped us in our business. So we actually did quite well during the through the pandemic in terms of growth, profitability, everything, while actually doing a lot of service also. So in that sense, I think uh, the pandemic gave us an opportunity to reflect, uh, understand our purpose and really galvanize people at all levels to do what is necessary. We also saw in the initial days of the pandemic, there was a huge run up uh, on the medicines. People were stocking up things. Uh, and even things like vitamins, all of this became shortage items. Mm -hmm. And we had to run the plants around the clock. And uh, it was, uh, you know, uh, quite an experience. But I must say that it was one of the most productive periods also for us in terms of bringing products to the market, getting the, converting the ideas into trials, into evidence and approvals. Uh, that level of pace was really unprecedented. And it also makes us reflect and say maybe... You know, we have to look at reinventing how we do our work. Can we accelerate everything? So that's one big lesson we took out. The, the, the other thing is that an organization, um, you know, if you, if you have a strong leadership team and they're empowered, they don't need a lot of direction. They don't need to be told, do this, do that, and all that. And that was the hallmark that I saw in our management team that everybody, you know, worked uh, very effortlessly, seamlessly to find the solutions, to make the place safe, to make, uh, to rise to the challenge of keeping everybody safe, putting facilities. We had to, you know, repurpose some of our uh, dormitories, hostels into quarantine centers. We had to pr run around the clock uh, medical aid system, mental health uh, coaches were available. Many, many things, and this all this helped, uh, you know, actually give a sense of confidence to the employee base that they will be safe and we will take care of them. So in, in many ways, I think if you take care of your people, they will take care of the business. And if you empower them, they will do the right thing. If the purpose is clear, they don't need a lot of direction. This is, uh, you know, some of the lessons that I learned uh, during this pandemic. Of course, the second wave was quite deadly. And uh, during that time, I think, uh, was the most testing period for our management team. We all uh, went through some very difficult times. We lost employees and, uh, you know, we were quite desperate in terms of trying to find a solution for the, for the Delta virus. And as the vaccines picked up, you know, then slowly we came back to normalcy. So it was a wonderful period in terms of understanding human beings, how they cope, how they, you know, once they get clarity, how they energy, they get energized by purpose and how they're driven uh, to, you know, serve. Uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about the service we did, but that was another uh, big activity that we undertook to feed uh, people who were displaced, 
uh, to put up centers, to provide hospitals the support they need, to make free medicines available to all the trust hospitals. All of that was part of the work we did. And uh, that and business, all of that, you know, was a continuum. We didn't really differentiate too much about it. We just thought this is an opportunity to serve, and we did. Yeah, it's very interesting. You know, it's almost like a warlike situation because, you know, you were, there was so much of pressure on you to deliver, you know, especially with the shortage of medicines, drugs, uh, you know, with the focus on looking for solutions. So a lot of pressure, a lot of uh, work, and uh, yet a lot of energy and sense of purpose as you delivered. So really, it's a, it's a very interesting story. Arundhati, would, would you have had similar issues for you uh, in terms of uh, maybe rethinking your priorities or uh, you know, doing something differently as a consequence of, uh, you know, did you have any new opportunities that you were able to take advantage of? I think you're muted. Yeah, sorry. Uh, the, I, of course, you know, there were new opportunities. There were also new priorities. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, the, our company, Salesforce, has what is called a one by one by one policy, meaning that we donate 1% of our equity or profits, 1% of our products, and 1% of our time. So every single employee gets seven days uh, paid leave in order to do voluntary work and work with the community. So, you know, this was a time when all of these key things came together. And we had people actually, you know, delivering uh, even oxygen cylinders, you know, literally on their shoulders into people's houses when uh, this couldn't be arranged in any other manner. Uh, not only that, you know, we came together to raise quite a lot of money more than a million dollars in order to donate to those uh, NGOs that were working in the fields of sanitation, nutrition, and education. So all of these three things were covered by us. And it was uh, whatever the employees gave, the company matched it dollar for dollar. So that, you know, the amounts that we could actually put out was quite large. Uh, so over and above these things, you know, uh, within the work itself, we tried to come up with things, with solutions to enable companies to come back to work safely. So we launched what was called work.com, which enabled you to tell every single person, every single employee uh, that this would be the kind of, uh, you know, minimum amounts that are minimum thresholds at which you would be allowed back into work. And thereafter, we could monitor their health status as the vaccines came onto the scene. All of that came in over here. Not only that, what had happened is because of social distancing, we could no longer accommodate, say, 50 people in a space meant for 50 people. We could accommodate only maybe 20 or 25. So actually speaking, you had to book your ships almost like a cinema booking, you know, so that, in fact, there were companies that wanted us to actually give the layout of the floor so that people could go ahead and, you know, actually do the booking so that groups could sit together. Okay. So all of these, you know, these were new products that came up very, very quickly. And we helped them, uh, help uh, companies with such products, not only here, but right across the globe, globally. Uh, besides this, you know, we also did a lot of work with the government. For instance, the Ministry of Health. COVID map was actually running on Tableau, which is our graphic analytics company uh, within the Salesforce, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, brand. And uh, they were actually showing, you know, which areas were turning green, which were turning red, which were turning yellow. And basically, there are a lot of supply chain uh, um, query, um, uh, observations that are coming on the chat. These would actually enable people to determine where the supplies should come from and create the redundancies that are required in the supply chain to ensure that you know the supply chain was not getting disrupted. So we did this. We also helped, uh, say, for instance, the government of Orissa. Uh, we did a project along with Deloitte in order to enable them to monitor all of the supplies in the various hospitals and the status of the patients therein. 
so that the supplies that were required in the hospitals could be promptly sent to them and they, and they didn't run out of supplies. So there were a number of solutions that we came up with, which actually were delivered to a number of, uh, of clients uh, right across the world, uh, whether it be vaccination, whether it be tracing of contact tracing, whether it be actually showing the status of COVID in various places, whether it be looking after the employee's own health and in the ensuring that they have a safe return back into work. So we did all of this. Alongside that, of course, as I told you, serving the community is something which is very, very important to us, and we continue to do that. All right. So it's interesting, you know, uh, to take what uh, Anandaji said a little further, you know, I think you know, this whole thing about giving them seven days of leave and tracking employees' health and trying to ensure that they are well before they come back. I think one issue that all of us, I mean, there has been a lot of discussion about is this whole, uh, you know, uh, process of, you know, all the consequences of work from home and the kind of blurring between work and life and the burnout that a lot of people have faced. And I would say, especially in the kind of industries that both of you are in, since there was so much of demand and so much of pressure on these organizations, uh, did you have to face a lot of burnout among employees? Uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of talk these days about, uh, you know, uh, mental well-being of employees being at the center stage of a leader's concerns. We are talking about compassion in leadership, about empathy. Uh, how does one really operationalize all of these and create a kind of sense of psychological safety for employees to talk about their maybe personal concerns uh, as they affect the workplace? So, I mean, any of you could go first. Uh, maybe we can start with uh, Arundhati. Yeah, of course, you know, if you are looking at, you know, uh, mental burnout, yes, there was burnout. Uh, you know, in the initial stages, in fact, uh, we have, as I told you, a very large support team. Okay. The support teams, first of all, the absenteeism went down like anything because everybody was at home, they were attending to their screens. But what surprised me hugely was that the turnaround time for problems really shrunk, meaning that people were jumping onto the problem as soon as it was appearing on the screen, even if they were not on that ship. So, you know, even in the middle of the night, if there is a problem, they would be at it and trying to work out, work it out. But as a result of that, within the first three, four months, we started seeing the burnout. And then we started actually counseling the people that stop for heaven's sake, you are not on duty at this point of time. It may be showing up on the screen, but there is a shift that is there that is looking into it, allow them to do it. You may know the answer, but you wait for your time in order to give that answer. Very difficult to do it, by the way. It may be easy to say, but when you know that you can solve this very easily, you've yeah. already done this for somewhere else, to just stay back and not work at it is very difficult. So, you know, we did arrange, like uh, Mr. Prasad said, we did arrange for a number of mental health sessions. So there were weekly sessions that were being run globally. And we also started running sessions internally here in India. And all of us, you know, we were so, we sort of encouraged people to take up something like, say, balcony gardening or, say, maybe cooking. I, for instance, you know, actually wrote my book during that period because that was distressing to me. Otherwise, you know, there would have been no other way of getting away from work. So I would sit down and write in a way it was a good thing. Otherwise, that book would never have got written. Uh, but uh, I could do that only because of the pandemic. Courtesy the pandemic, the book got written. So, you know, we kept encouraging people, do something different. Your screen is not your world. You know, you have to start looking after others. And more than just, you know, work, what happened was, I think, with children starting uh, schooling from home, it became a very big struggle for people. And you can imagine a small family where, you know, parents are living in one bedroom and there's a whole uh, young family living in the other. There would be two kids, there would be the spouse, and there would be our employee. Four of them in four corners of the room with four screens, okay? 
Now, managing all of that is very tough. I know how difficult it is to remain committed to a screen. Imagine a young child, you know. The child would do all kinds of uh, calisthenics, excepting looking at the screen and actually studying. So one parent or the other would really need to look after the child. So we started understanding this and therefore, you know, started making provisions for people to take time off depending upon what were their requirements at home. Uh, because this was absolutely important, and especially the second wave, as Mr. Prasad said, it was devastating for all of us. We lost so many people, you know, some people, some some youngsters became orphans. So there were such, you know, terrible instances, you know, where you would even find it difficult to lift the phone and talk to the relatives of the employee, because you didn't really know what to say. What was there to say? Means everybody had tried their level best, nothing had worked. And uh, it was really a very tough time. So, of course, you know, during this entire time, we tried to the extent possible to be as connected as possible, to keep finding out from our people how they were doing, giving them time off. We, in fact, you know, started what we said were well, wellness days. So you could take a day off any point of time. You know, you could have a four-day week. You could just take a day off and say, I'm, I just need to be stressed. And no questions asked. We started forcing people to go on PTOs wherever they could, even if it meant just staying at home. But please take the time off in order to relax. These were the kinds of things that we did. But I think you know we looked at it in a in a holistic manner. Uh, there were burnout cases, and yes, we supported them through it. Uh, but uh, that was part of uh, the entire uh, you know experience. Thank you. That was really interesting. Uh, Prasad, you have always uh, sort of advocated empathy and compassion. I've seen right. I mean, from long ago. So, how did you sort of use those values in the current situation? How have you prepared your organization? And in fact, I think we are running out of time. So, you know, any last thoughts also okay, on sure. how to build an organization that? So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, in in every organization, everybody says people are our most important asset. Uh, and this pandemic challenged that and asked us to demonstrate that. Yes. And whether we really care for people, how do we take care of them? How do we give them flexibility? How do we give them support? So whatever Arundhati said, a lot of that was relevant even for us. But at the, at the, at the highest level, leadership and leaders, they have to be good human beings first. And we have we have heard of stories of some tech entrepreneur firing people on Zoom, things like that. This shows a, a people person unfit for a leadership role when you can't connect with people, when you can't, uh, uh, you know, be a good human being first. You can't be a great leader. So we also did many of these things. But the highlight for me during the pandemic was talking to some of the spiritual leaders. Uh, I had webinars organized with. Uh, the Dalai Lama with uh, Sadhguru, Sri Sri. And I, I, I also had a very interesting conversation with the Prime Minister of Bhutan, who's also a medical doctor, but also a Prime Minister and a very simple human being. And all these talks really brought out a lot of uh, succor to people to understand that, you know, what they're going through and understand how to manage them. We had many sessions on mental health, we had on meditation, we had helplines. And we used to have sessions of yoga through the video channel for people. We still have them. Every alternate day, we have a yoga class at 6.30 a.m. through the people who want to do it can log in and follow and do that. But all that comes out of leaders having empathy for their people, being authentic about their, you know, uh, uh, their own empathy for the people. And this authenticity was challenged. And many companies did not show up very well. And... Uh, I'm uh, hoping that we are not in that bracket. No, no. <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much. I think, you know, unfortunately, I think uh, we've, I think, run out of uh, time now. So I, it was a really engaging uh, discussion. I just want to, to, each of you to take maybe one minute and, you know, sum up uh, the way forward for all of us as we move, hopefully, to, uh, you know, taking the lessons from this pandemic forward in our organizations. Any last thoughts that each of you? So we can start with Prasad. 
Yeah. yeah. So I, um, the, f this pandemic really made me reflect on what culture, what capitalism is about. We cannot be growing infinitely in a world with finite resources. And I'm, I read a lot. I read Paul Polman's book on uh, net positive. Uh, I, I, I read about, uh, I read all the Larry Fink letters. And, and I recommend to the audience that are watching us to read his latest letter about the power of capitalism if applied properly. And that was my biggest, uh, you know, reflection during the pandemic. And I, I am taking up ESG and purpose and connecting it and making it much more integral to the organization's strategy. And uh, that's my big takeaway for the pandemic that, you know, we have to step back and see what the role of capitalism is in society and what companies like us must and should do to be a force for good while doing well financially. And uh, that's what I'd like to, you know, end this uh, talk with. That's really lovely. Uh, Arundhati, what about you? Any last thoughts? Yeah, one image, you know, that stays in my mind is uh, was an image sent on WhatsApp by a cousin of mine uh, from a place called Raichak, uh, from where actually you should be able to see the Himalayas, but you never do. So this uh, the cousin, she actually sent me a picture of the mountains and said this is the first time that anybody with living memory in this town has ever seen the mountains. You know, so this was in the first wave when everything had closed down. And that sort of stuck in my mind as to what uh, uh, Mr. Prasad is saying. It is very true. It is very true that, you know, we need to take care of the environment. Otherwise, the environment will hit back in various ways. And this is, we have only one world to live in. There is no way that, you know, one country or the other will be able to make a difference. It has to be a collaborative effort. So I think, you know, the main thing that came through for me was that collaboration was of the essence. Without collaboration, we are not going to get anywhere. And more than anything else, you know, we have to protect what we have and leave something behind for the next generations where they do not blame us for having, you know, spoiled everything. In respect of ESG, for instance, you know, actually the company has also uh, created not only what is called the sustainability cloud, but we have now got a number of resources that are purely working on ways of creating the sustainability cloud to help companies become more accountable towards this. So this is something that is absolutely important for all of us, uh, not only in the sense of ESG, but also in the sense that, you know, if we are not helping out each other, if we don't have each other's backs, you know, there is no way that we can grow and we can prosper and we can have the kind of, you know, higher standards of living. Because even during the pandemic, you know that there are certain sections that have become even more deprived. What do we do in order to bring up those sections? How do we innovate so that, you know, they have the same opportunities that people who are better off have? How do we address those issues? Those issues are very much there, but they are not addressed as, as of now. How do we ensure a more equitable world? Throughout what I did in SBI, even during the opening of the Jandhan Yojana accounts, there were a lot of people who were telling us that you're doing a you know useless job. And I used to tell them that for me, you know, in inclusiveness, it's a it's a article of faith. It is not something that I do just because I want to be just because I've been asked to do it. I'm doing it because I believe in it. And that's what that's something that we need to understand. We cannot have the kind of gaps between the haves and the have nots. The world has got to be a more equitable place. Thank you so much. It was a lovely discussion, and I wish we could have had more time. Uh, you know, thank you so much for joining me and uh, sharing your insights and thoughts with us. Uh, I will now hand over to Kavi to take over and to move on to the next session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. What a what a fascinating session that was. I mean, every time I hear such things, I I'm, I'm reminded of of a quote which says that each generation is just a trustee of the planet for the coming generations. And we ought to remind ourselves of that. If not, 
events like the pandemic come in to remind us of the trusteeship that we have. That role is something that we must bear more in mind. Anyway, so let's get some Tosh Nair's graphic here for us and let's look at it and let's and as we are looking at the graphic i'll also invite a couple of students and in case you're not able to see the graphic fully please go and expand click on that icon at the top right of your screens and you'll be able to see much more of the graphic and he's done it live uh, as always as as he's as the conversation was on and i'm reminded of monitors and sanitizers and remedies aware and purpose and what a bouquet uh, and mental health and of course the ultimate thing of children uh, you know the greatest fight in every family that mankind has known at least in my family and that has been the fight for bandwidth when everybody's video has been up so all of these fights have come up as much as larger events and conversations like purpose and how do we reimagine for the future? How do we change ourselves for the future? How do we get ready? And how do we use this pandemic for better? Now, I'm going to pull in two students from uh, Bitsom on screen and uh, we're going to ask them a few questions. We thought of them largely to ensure that an intergenerational lens to what's come up from the stage is also maintained and we get to understand a few things from them as well. We'll keep it quick, we'll keep it sharp, but please bear in mind that we are uh, we, we're going to reflect on the session that's just gotten over. So I'm going to request uh, this, uh, I'm going to request uh, the organizers to remove the picture from Santosh. This picture will be available, of course, for us for later. And I'm going to bring the focus on the two lovely people out here. So I'm first going to request you to introduce yourself in as brief a way as possible, just in a line or two. First, start off with that, and then I'll come back to you with a question. Any of you? Yeah, sure. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks, Kavi. Um, well, I'm Eha Shri the, uh, from the founding batch. And uh, prior to joining Bitsom, I have had six years of experience with the Tata Group. Great. Hi, Kavi. Thank you. And it's all, it's great to be here. I'm Pashang, part of the founding class of Bitsom, <clears throat> signing in from Bombay. And it's just a pleasure to share this space. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I'll go to Megashri. Megashri, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name, name right. So if I'm not, I'm sorry. Uh, if there is just one thing that you take away from this conversation thus far, what would that be? So uh, the conversation has been so much uh, true that I can completely relate to having worked in the corporate for about six years and uh, having joined a new organization in the wake of the pandemic. I can so strongly relate to what Arundhati Ma'am and Prashad Zor said. One of the biggest takeaway that I had was uh, said by uh, Prashad Sir when he mentioned about uh, that to be a good leader, you have to have that care, flexibility. And, uh, you know, like you have to show that authenticity in yourself. And why I say it's very important in this era, it's because most of the um, youngsters and the employees who are joining in corporations, they are, there is a shift when they're actually choosing to go with the managers. They are actually joining a team for the manager over uh, joining a high paying job. So, yeah, that is where it comes very, very, very profound that it's the manager who should be really authentic. And that's how you attract talent. And I completely resonate very strongly with it. Okay. There is Satish Pradhan, one of your illustrious predecessors, giving you, wishing you more power to your elbow on the chat. For now, Pashang, uh, what do you think as uh, one thing that you would want to take away from this conversation? If there's just one thing, quickly, briefly, but one thing. So what resonated with me was the importance of having a uh, clarity and purpose, mm -hmm. because a period of transition can uh, is cause disruption, of course, and it can either be viewed as a threat or an opportunity. Mm -hmm. But when you're able to view the situation and have that clarity of thought about how you're going to approach it, mm -hmm. it sort of really gives a sense of direction to the organization as a whole. And also it instills a sense of confidence amongst the workforce because now they have something to aim for and something to work towards rather than just being a little clueless and running around like potentially a headless chicken. 
Okay, good. Uh, so let's the, uh, the the last question for you folks. But you've been following. I hope you've been following the chat as well. And I'm going to request you to pick one conversation from the chat, or something from the chat that really resonated with you that you perhaps don't have an answer right now. If you do, fine. If you don't, that's fine too. But something that stays with you is that you want to go back and talk about any one from anyone. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, I actually uh, looked at, looked over the chat and this was one of the first questions that came from Charles when he mentioned uh -huh. uh, collaboration with the government in absence of the pandemic, whether it was possible or not. So I do have a take on this and I believe... Um, to what Jv Prasad sir said that if you have a common or a larger purpose to serve, it's it, it somehow becomes more seamless and more organic to build on to that collaboration. And hence, it would actually be possible when you are serving a bigger purpose and you want to steadfast and serve. Okay. Uh, collaboration becomes more organic. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Megashree. Pashang, what do you think? So what really stuck with me was uh, Mr. Prasad mentioned that uh, leaders should be good people first. And there was a comment in the chat from one of my classmates, which really stuck, which was the great resignation is not as much a resignation as much as it is people shifting from bosses to leaders. And the, the importance of being empathetic as a leader is something that has to be really thought about. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you, Megashri. Thank you, Pashang. Wonderful to have you here with us and please continue the conversation. Please look at all other conversations that are coming in. And of course, wishing you all the very best in your career ahead. Thank you very thank much you. for being here. Okay. Thank you. We are running behind time, but we will catch up. Uh, the next the next session is uh, is something which is a bit personally uh, something that I'm really, really looking forward to, which is about reimagining innovation talent in the world of work. So there is uh, Shrijit Mishra, Chief Innovation Officer and Head of Head Group Services in Aditya Burla Group, checkered corporate career, joined by two very famous people. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Srijit for him to lead this conversation. If you joined us for the first time, you will have to exit this session and join into the next session on Airmeet. If you're on YouTube, you can just sit back and wait for the stream coming onto your screen. If you're on Airmeet, please exit this session and join into session two. And I will see you at the end of session two. Over to you to enjoy session two.